I'm happy to be here with you, Tristan, because he's another visionary. Um, and I love this guy. He's really quite extraordinary. Um, you've been working for more than a decade now, coming out of the, the belly of <laughs> Silicon Valley um, and becoming the conscience, as some said, of, of, uh, of the valley and so forth. And, and speaking to people all around the world, and Congress and Europe and, and so forth, and wanting to build a movement to transform technology, all of those kinds of things, which feels really important. Um, so the first thing I want to ask is for your elevator pitch, kind of <laughs> to get that, um, because the work you're doing is so important. Um, if you have a, an elevator pitch that says, here's what I've seen and learned and where we are, let's start with that, and then I have some more <laughs> follow-up questions that are more personal, perhaps. But sure. Go ahead. Um, well, I think many of you might already be aware of, of this overall work. Um, uh, the issue is that technology is holding the pen of history right now. Uh, what I mean by that is if two billion people every day, more than the size of Christianity, are jacked into Facebook, for example, and YouTube, um, and that these products are not neutral, but because of their stock prices being chained to how much human attention can we extract from society, uh, it creates this race to the bottom of the brainstem, this competition for attention that um, determines increasingly the outcomes of everything we're seeing in society. Because people check their phones 80 times a day from the moment you wake up in the morning and you undo your alarm to the moment you go to bed and you set your alarm. Um, elections, children's development, mental health, our culture, our values are increasingly shaped by technology. And it comes into conflict with the social fabric. It, across every layer, layer, it's very much like, I mean, Paul being the previous speaker is the perfect person to be after because this is kind of a, a form of climate change. This is not about addiction. It's not about being hooked to your phone. It's a system that is designed to figure out what are deeper and deeper puppet strings in the human social psyche to pull, and you win the lower you go. So that's the problem that we have to solve, and we can talk a lot more about all the things that have happened in the last year on progress that's been made too, but. So in your center, Center for Humane Technology, um, you've created the catalog of harms. Here's the way for, you know, ch children's development or the harms of, of the misuse of it that uh, feeds civil wars around the world or all of these kinds of things. Um, but I also know that you are trying to make a turn if you will, and this really follows what Paul was saying of looking for the gift. Mm -hmm. um, the Center for Humane Technology, having seen the issues, now is beginning to look toward building a movement to transform this. Can you say anything? Yeah, um, so I guess I wanna share um, some, some stuff that I haven't really shared before about what got us to this, this point. Um, I uh, used to be a technology entrepreneur. My friends in college started some of these products. One of my closest friends started Instagram uh, at the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab. We actually worked on an app together called Send the Sunshine, um, which was the idea that you could use persuasive technology for good. Uh, and if you had someone who was depressed because they were in a zip code where you had bad weather for seven days in a row, it would send a text message to their friend and text, text them, hey, your friend Sean has had bad weather where you send a photo of the sunshine to them. And so that was actually something I worked on before the iPhone with the founder of Instagram. And I saw how persuasive technology would be able to steer society. There was actually the last class in this lab was on the future of persuasive technology and the ethics of persuasive technology. Uh, and someone said, well, what if in the future you had a profile of every single person? What would uniquely persuade their mind? Do they respond to signals of authority? Do they like Jack Cornfield? If you said Jack Cornfield said something is true, would they feel more likely to believe it? And I realized how dangerous that would be if you had a perfect ability to manipulate every single human mind. Um, and as I said in the introduction, I was a magician as a kid, and I've studied all the sort of lenses of persuasion. And 
So I first tuned into it back then, and then I landed at Google as a technology entrepreneur. They bought our company, and I was kind of depressed at Google um, because I was in the room with the people building Gmail, and I thought if there was ever a room where people would be caring about their impact, where email's impact on society. Email's a very stressful product. It sort of shreds your attention. It's a dope, you check your email once, you check it again a minute later. Uh, you read some bad climate news, you check it again to run away from yourself. Um, uh, it's a very stressful product and a lot, of, I mean, how many people here feel like they have a problem with email? Okay, right, so it's, it's a thing, right? But no one talks about that, it's not on the agenda, right? And I thought, in the product design room, that surely there must be some set of people that care about this. But then, if there was ever a room, it would have been this room, because this is the Gmail team. This is the people building the product. And there wasn't that conversation happening. And I, you know, the story's been told, but I, I made this presentation. I actually went home um, every night from work uh, around 6, 7 p.m., and then I worked on it for about three or four hours every night for about a month. Um, and it was about how never before in history have a billion people's thoughts, attention, choices, relationships been shaped by 50 designers, engineers in Silicon Valley. And this was back in 2013. I was very nervous. I, I was really lost at Google. I didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't know whether this presentation would have an impact, but I, um, I released it and went viral. And I sort of informally got this role as a design ethicist, because no one had ever figured this out. Like, what does it mean to ethically shape? two billion people's thoughts. And I saw, increasingly, as I started it deeper, you know, this is just game theory, everyone's caught in this race for attention, they can't not do this, YouTube has to get people's attention, and if they let go, then Facebook's just gonna swoop in, so they're, they're caught, they're all bound. It's not that there's evil, bad people, but they're caught by this race. And in seeing all this, I just wanna say, I mean, there were probably two years that went by when I had almost no idea what to do. Um, it's amazing that so much of this conversation has transformed. There's been a lot of huge accomplishments we can probably talk about, but there were literally days or weeks where I felt like all I did was check my email and read Wikipedia. And I say that because I had no idea. Like, it's like, when you, imagine you see climate change, and you see this huge thing, like this is gonna affect attention, mental health, depression, you know, showing kids infinite evidence of their friends having fun without them. We've never before done that. We took, we've just created a world where now 100 million teenagers, it's never been easier to see infinite scrolling evidence that your friends are having fun without you. <laughs> look, look what we did for the world. Um, yeah, wiring kids together into social pressure, you know, social management, reputation management. So now they liked, you know, my friend Susie liked that photo, but she didn't like this one, but I saw her like that other friend's photo, that guy, and what if she doesn't like mine? And all of that reputation management is this just ridiculous thing we've thrown on the backs of these young people. Anyway, in seeing all of this, in the way that you would see climate change, right? It's like, it's, it's easy to get distracted by one issue, like addiction, we're hooked to our phones. Or another issue, you know, mental health, um, what we're doing to, to kids' mental health, or elections. But when you see it all together, it's like connecting, you know, the coral reefs and the species lost in the Amazon and the hurricanes and the wildfires and saying there's actually a common force that's driving all that. And upon seeing that, I felt incredibly hopeless because there really wasn't much support. Um, which is why I was saying, you know, I, I would spend weeks inside of Google, sometimes just answering emails and just saying, once you see this big thing, what do you do? I mean, what do you do if you saw that, right? Um, I had no idea, and I tried for two years inside of Google to try and change some things. Uh, I didn't get very far. And I decided um, in January 2016 to leave and to create a public conversation. And I had no idea what that would look like. I didn't know what it meant to say, we're going to launch a movement, or we're going to... How do you do that? I mean, I literally... I was a, trained as a product designer, product engineer, computer scientist, um, I don't know anything about social movements. And, you know, there was just, I just what I want to communicate is just the, the many years in which almost nothing happened. Like four years, basically. Until I think the thing that really kicked off was 60 Minutes. I was on 60 Minutes in April 2017. And, um, 
you know, that really woke the whole world up to what was called brain hacking or persuasive technology and the fact that it's not by accident, it's by design. And that happening after the, the election um, of Trump and the Russia stuff that came out, I think just exploded this issue into the popular culture. But what I want to get, you know, communicated to all of you is just how hopeless it felt for years. And how when you're in the present experience of hopelessness, not briefly, but for years, how you also couldn't see things that are happening now. Because, so, go ahead. So you're, in a way, you're a whistleblower, um, which is a really hard role to hold. I tried to, to connect you with Daniel Ellsberg, who's very sympathetic to whistleblowers and to make this connection. Yeah. So you carry that weight. You were depressed. You tried to do it um, without any compadres or people. Then all of a sudden, you're invited into the halls of power. It becomes a public conversation. We have to look at what technology is doing, what AI will do, what, and so forth. But then you said, a phrase we've heard elsewhere, that there really aren't adults in the room, that you can go to Congress and talk to people, and they don't understand. Yeah. So what do you do? Um, you know, you talked about amusing ourselves to death and, and, and so forth. Um, is it possible to get people to understand who, how, how does this move from having taken over our lives to be transformed when there aren't adults in the room? What have you found? Yeah, um, uh, not to, to, to wallow in the, um, uh, the dark stuff, but the, it's, a, it's a real, um, I, I want to get to the positive, but when, when you, what, I, I did say this last year too, you know, we found ourselves in the Senate Intelligence Committee when they're first starting the investigation of Russia, I've met the former Secretary of Defense, I've met, you know, heads of state, I was at a Macron event in France last year, and you, you're with all these people, and from a distance you think, oh my God, these majestic buildings, these suits, you know, there's, there's this power, and then you, you know, as my friend Michael Murphy, the founder of Esalen, says, when you walk into the halls of power, you realize the whole thing's held, held together in, with scotch tape. Um, and why would you know, people in positions at the Pentagon or the Department of Defense know anything about how social media's nooks and crannies could be manipulated. And then you realize that, you know, we and our friends are some of the best people that we had, and that's an enormous responsibility. <laughs> and, and then that's, that's the hardest part, and then the, the good part is, so all of you who work so hard to try and change the world to the one you want it to be, you suddenly find yourself in a position where you can change it. And that creates now this whole wave of pressure to say, the waves are coming, grab your surfboard, and jump on a wave. Um, because, <laughs> thanks. And, and there is a, a huge cost to that. I mean, as some of you know from whatever activism that you do, when, when there suddenly is interest in an issue, you've got to jump on it and, and get it to go. And I want to say, in terms of just leading with some of the positive things that have happened in the last year, so here you have this situation, this race to the bottom of the brainstem to, you know, grab human attention. And through either fearful images or whatever it is that will activate the, the kind right. of most um, primitive parts of you to allure you or frighten you in some way, whether it's political or social in any way. Exactly. Right? It starts with the autoplay on YouTube. It's a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We'll remove the stopping cue. Stopping cues are how your mind knows to wake up and say, maybe I want to do something else, but if I take the stopping cue away, you just keep going. It's like a conversation you can't leave because the person keeps talking. They're not giving you a stopping cue so you can get out. So, um, but that's the innocuous part. Then we have to get deeper in the attention economy, so we have to go into tribalism. If you watch what Russia did, there was a whole playing to pride and identity. You know, um, so, you know, tribalism works better in the attention economy, and it's this race to the bottom of the brainstem, outrage, negative emotions spread faster than positive emotions, false things spread six times faster than true things. So, okay, sorry. There, <laughs> this, but this is the race to the bottom for the attention economy. What I wanted to say was, in the last year, it was actually since Wisdom last year, in May of last year, Apple and Google both launched digital well-being initiatives the same month, setting off from a race to the bottom, a race to the top for who can care more about people's well-being. 
Now, I don't want to claim this as massive success because this is like in the roadmap of what we need to do, 0.01 baby steps in the direction of what we need. But if you ask me, back at Google, back when there was those days of just reading Wikipedia and answering emails and having no idea that this would ever change, that Apple, Google, both launching digital well-being initiatives, including the phrase time well spent in their messaging, implementing features like Grayscale when you look at your Android phone or your friend's Android phone late at night and it's suddenly gray, that's going to ship on a billion phones by the end of the year. Now, I'm not saying that's like the big success we're looking for, but to go from no change to now a race to the top through public pressure, it's through language and conversation. If you think about what does it mean to have pressure, it's, it's actually a human experience. What does it mean for this to be a movement? Where does the movement exist? Where, where is it? Is there some blob in reality you can draw an outline and say that's the movement? Or is it just the way that language starts to and conversation starts to create a shared conversation? So if you're at Google and you go to three meetings in one day and someone says, have you heard of technology hijacking our minds, the race for attention, and why we need time well spent? And you have three meetings in one day that say that. That's pressure. And that's not a lot to create that surround sound. That's just three conversations that a human embodied animal has to, in their meetings throughout the day, experience. So what's been amazing for me is seeing the way that language and conversation are the movement. And you all are in a position, many of you are between the mindfulness worlds and have these values. And you're also, some of you, inside the technology companies here or work with them or know them. And it's actually a matter of creating that conversation that leads to that change. So, so Thich Nhat Hanh famously said that the next Buddha will be the Sangha, will be the community. It's not going to be one person. And in some way, I think both for the predicament we're in with the development of AI and with all the internet and all the things <clears throat> that, like climate change, we really have to look at how it's affecting our lives and our consciousness. I worry about you as the whistleblower, one of the carriers of this, and I want you to have support. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think about Thich Nhat Hanh's phrase in some way and realize that what's going to make the change is just what you're saying, is having in some way realizing that the people who are going to make the change are, is, is us. Yeah. You know, you're That's able good. to be a voice for right. it, but you need support in some way. And I want to ask, how many of you in this room feel that you would like in your own way to support a transformation to humane technology? Just to raise your hand. Awesome. I, I want you to feel that and know that these are, these are your peeps, yep. you know? So that's important to say. Tristan, we're, we're just about to finish up Tristan. He's going to be down at the Q&A stage just after this. Um, and two other things to, to say is to connect it. One is Paul talked so beautifully about how in the problem there is an opportunity or a gift. And you've given years of your life and a kind of passion to show us the problem and now turning toward gift and solution. But I want us to feel that within technology there is some possibilities yeah. that we could really change the world. Right. Um, supporting the work you're doing in our, ourselves collectively. And one of the little things that we've been, or projects we're talking about, is to do what Paul did for climate change with Drawdown, a kind of crowdsourcing of the best experts around the world to say, what are the hundred things we can all do that will reverse global warming, that we're also talking about doing a Drawdown for technology and getting 50 or 100 people around the world to bring the best vision and say, not one solution, but what are the 50 things that That's we right. can do? So if you're interested, you can go to Q&A stage and listen to Tristan or sign up with him and with Open Source Compassion, which will also be down there, um, and participate in some way. Um, mostly, I want you to feel the goodwill of this room <laughs> and all those hands, my friend. Thank you. It's hard being young and being a whistleblower. It ain't easy, yeah. you know? And then you go and talk to President Macron, and. He's a nice guy, but he's kind of clueless about what's happening, you know? And we don't have to talk about Washington, D.C. <laughs> so we need you, he needs you, and you need yeah. him, and we're in it together. And thank you, Tristan. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you all. Thank you.